Don Donna Lang and others we set up. Great. I guess it's been now it's been about a year. It was during COVID, and uh, it was great to to have you, Christian, do that moderation moderating that. And that's when when we first started to try to connect you up with this. So great. really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, that was Lonnie Bunch's book. That's yeah. right. It was great. That's right. It was just a really moderate, moderate, amazing story. Um, and we know that you have to take off at about 10.55. Yeah, that was Lonnie so we'll Bunch. Make, we'll make sure that we get you out of here in time with it. Um, people are starting to... Have, have you let anybody in yet, Steph? No. No, we haven't let anybody in yet. We yeah. can you whenever mind. you're ready. And Christian, I'll, I'll, I'll let Did you... Did you hear an echo? Let you uh, introduce yourself a little bit. I'm only going to say a couple of words for you, and you can tell us a little bit more about your background too. Good. That's okay. Do you want me to start? Uh, Dennis, you want to take a few more minutes? Yeah, it's not quite uh, 10 o'clock, and that's when most people are expecting the yep. program to start. Okay. Um, what is the uh, that's, what does it mean with the slash through your O? Christian. Oh, my father's Norwegian, so it means honor thy father. Is that right? <laughs> no, it's it's uh, the spelling of the of the name in Norwegian. So uh, in Norway, they pronounce it Overland. Uh. Right? Hmm. Over here, we pronounce it Overland. Okay. Uh -huh. How do you pronounce it? Overland. Uh -huh. When I go back over there, my cousins go Overland. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, now I understand with, with Brian Rood being uh, chair of the search committee when they've hired you. Now I understand a lot more about that Norwegian connection. <laughs> Coon Valley. Have you been down to Coon Valley area? Oh, yeah, I have. Yeah. And, and what is that build? What's that? What's that museum that they have there in Coon Valley? Um, Norwegian's uh, cultural. There's a, there's a Norwegian Cultural Center, but there's also, I mean, there's so many of um, those around Vesterheim in Iowa, too. Yeah. Um, and then Brian was, I think it's the Norwegian American, um, let's see, Historical Society in St. Olaf's University. He was chair of that, St. Olaf's College. Um, yeah, so he's been into Scandinavian Norwegian history and American history for a long time. Yeah, well, that's mm. great. And he's in the book club, too, with us. Uh, I can't remember if he was on that night when you were there or not. Yeah, I think was he, he was. Okay. He yeah, was he was president of our board. Right. On the right. Board of curators for many years and was president. He hired me. Right. Yeah, that's why I say that Norwegian mafia, I guess it's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we've got two minutes beforehand, so I'm going to start to admit people. Okay, oh, that sounds good. Thank you. You bet. So Dennis, what were you for Halloween last night? Um, well, I was pretty scary. I was myself. Oh, that is <laughs> not another emeritus. Yeah, Kids, yeah we don't, don't uh, we don't get any trick or treaters here at all. So. Oh, oh really? Huh. I was uh, I was asking uh, Stephanie when she was letting people in. What was the uh, the uh, candy to effort ratio in her neighborhood. Uh, she's on <laughs> Willie Street. And so it gets to be a little, when you get these places where there's a lot of density, the candy to the candy to effort ratio, uh, you know, is much more favorable when you get out like that. You're right, right. Kurt, what happened in Monona? Uh, I didn't get very many. I got some, I got a couple of interesting looks at the ring camera, right? Little kids were playing with the ring camera. <laughs> Oh, geez. Um, so I got way too many Snickers left. So, well, <laughs> yeah, there should be a place. There's that one dentist when I was in La Crosse, there was a dentist who would buy every piece of candy for a nickel. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> he's, he's trying to get kids not to eat the candy. So uh, that's what that's what he was working on anyway. It was pretty funny. Um, okay. I hit the wrong button when it said "Okay, recording." Oh, I hit leave. I hit left. Leave meeting. Sorry about that. Are you back? No. And so let me try and share again. Okay. Um, I I need to be okayed for sharing again. Uh, Stephanie, you, you bet. Yep. I will do that for you right, right. now.
There you go. Okay. You like the wizard, Stephanie, behind the curtains, but nothing happens without you. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, okay, are we back live? Yeah. yeah. Yes. We got yep. you now. Awesome. Well, should we get going, then, Dennis? Sure. Well, uh, thanks for everybody joining us today. Um, I'm really pleased uh, to have Kristen Overland uh, from the, uh, the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society about all the new things happening with there, with the new building, where it's going to be, how he decided what's happening with it. Uh, it's a great story. I've heard it a little bit before when he moderated the book club uh, book for me for the Historical Society. Uh, so I'm going to let Christian introduce himself as much as he wants, but he came from the Ford uh, Historical Site in uh, Dearborn, I believe it is, where you've been for, I don't know, about 20 years, and then you've been with us since 2018. So we're really happy to have you with us and uh, look forward to what you can tell us about what's happening with this exciting new program and uh, how we're all going to be able to enjoy it. So take Thank it away, you, Christian. Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here with all of you uh, this morning. So a little bit about my background. Terry wanted to talk about that. I actually I've been in the museum business for close to 35 years now. And I started off at the Minnesota Historical Society when I was a wee lad, um, fresh out of undergraduate school, went back to graduate school and started to go out east and worked in Cooperstown, Baseball Hall of Fame, historic Deerfield in Massachusetts. And as Terry said, uh, 26 years um, actually in Michigan at the Henry Ford, uh, which is an American history complex that has everything from a huge outdoor village of innovators, structures that were moved in there. So Henry moved in, the Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop, Edison's Menlo Park from New Jersey, uh, you name it, Noah Webster's house where he wrote the Blue Black Speller Dictionary. Uh, and then the Henry Ford Museum itself too is a 12 acre building, uh, one huge teak floor of exhibitions, 405,000 square feet. So a fantastic American history collection, mostly focusing on, focusing on uh, technology and innovation. So, and as Terry said, I started here uh, in February, February 12th, actually Lincoln's birthday in 2018. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this new history center idea, which I hope people have started to hear about. Uh, it's been going on for about 21 years now. And it was started by Governor Thompson. And let's see if we can get the slide. There we go. Started by Governor Thompson. And really, he did the first enumeration on this. And the idea was, is to, how do we actually create a new, at that point, it was going to be a museum to tell the stories of Wisconsin. So we built this building first. It's kind of chapter one of trying to get to this. This is the State Archive Preservation Facility. This is here in uh, Madison. It's uh, off of East Washington. It's on the Ahara River. So the little space that you're seeing here um, is facing the river. That's actually the travel care suite. So it's close to 300,000 square feet where we store most of the collection, archival, 3D, as well as um, uh, photographs and film. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So the idea of that was organizing the collection, creating access to it so we can mine the stories for this new museum. And so we moved the collection in there, uh, mostly finishing in 2019. And so then the pandemic hit, but we've been actively collecting ever since and organizing those stories. So a couple of stories, um, Ada Deer, of course, uh, we just received her archive and her papers. And of course she was uh, the first uh, woman leader of the Oneida as well as um, she was built uh, Pre President Clinton's um, BIA secretary and director, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and an incredible uh, advocate and great stories of advocacy, a Wisconsin story that tells a national story. And so when I think about these experiences that we have too, they're more than just Wisconsin. I don't know if everybody knows this, but uh, our organization started in 1846 before statehood. And Lyman Draper, our first director, actually was an antiquarian and collecting founding fathers' papers, things from Madison, Jefferson, Daniel Boone's manuscript he collected, those type of things, maps, all sorts of uh, things coming and bringing them here to, to the territory. And so the whole idea was creating this repository of American history at that point in time. And Lyman continued to do it and then gave his papers and his objects to the Historical Society, creating the massing of what we call 
uh, the American Center or the Center for American History Research. And that's actually in our state statutes. We're the only state in the United States that has this massive of an American history collection. So the question that we started to look at, why just tell the Wisconsin story? We can tell the story of America, the North American story, if you will, of the people and the land uh, going back 12,000 years and then tell Wisconsin story in that context. So that's what we're gonna do. So with that, we also collected um, in the 60s, a massive civil rights collection. It said, you know, for the Wisconsin Historical Society, a lot of scholars talk about us and saying, you can't really write a credible book about American civil rights in a, a national context if you, unless you use our archive. So Taylor Branch is parting the waters, for instance, um, it used our archive to do that. But it's uh, manuscripts, it's photographs, it's objects. This is actually a, a national yet Wisconsin story. These are a set of school decks from, from the Freedom School in Milwaukee at the um, the method, met, let's see, Matthew Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And this was gifted to us in uh, a couple of years ago. It comes from the mid 60s. 65 being the freedom summer. And so this is part of a, what's going to be telling the story in the, in the history center. We have a mass comm collection too, that uh, goes back to the beginning of NBC's radio records to TV records. Um, also uh, the largest collection of newspapers outside the uh, library of Congress in the, in the world. So this collection we just received, uh, the last part of it is the John Chancellor collection. Of course, John Chancellor was a journalist um, and then NBC anchor uh, for about a decade before Tom Brokaw took over. And then uh, of course he was at Tom Brokaw's side during many of the presidential elections until his retirement here in Wisconsin. We have a um, recent acquisition from the Hmong. This is from the Yang family. This actually came in uh, in uh, 1972, they brought this with them uh, into uh, the United States and, and actually came into Green Bay in 79. And then they just gave this to us recently. What this is, is a kind of hereditary silver. This is uh, passed down from family to family. And the woman who uh, had no heirs decided to pass them to us to tell the story of the mom. So this is a way of passing wealth from family to family down through the line. So stories of exploration too, and inspiration, right? So when we think about innovation, um, we want to tell a variety of stories of Wisconsin and national. So for this, this is an ultralight. And this is an ultralight that was used to actually bring whooping cranes, training them on how to fly south um, from the small little hatchlings moving forward. We actually have the costume of the pilot too, that's actually a, a crane costume, a lot of fun. But uh, we acquired this a couple of years ago recently acquired this computer. This is Judy Faulkner's, one of her very first computers that she wrote her code on for Epic. So this, of course, um, is the beginning of a billion dollar uh, company uh, that does quite well. Um, medical records all over the world are being organized by Epic. But this is not just um, uh, used in the hospital at this point in time for you know, moving electronic records around. Her first generation was actually a finding aid for hard copy files. So this is the very beginning of Epic. And of course, Oscar Mayer, can't tell the story of Wisconsin without talking about brats and meats and different things and cheese, of course. But we have the 1969 Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. And staying with foodways, uh, I think people know this man, this is, uh, of course, Craig Culver, and this is with his family's first restaurant sign. It's an old A&W uh, sign that's been painted over. Recent acquisition again, too, for those who remember Happy Days, Patsy Weber's uh, UW letter sweater and is worn in the show, and we uh, recently pulled this in. And one of the reasons why we do this um, collecting entertainment in this way is because we have a great partnership with the university. And that's the Center for Film and Theater Research. We actually have uh, been doing that since the early 60s. And we have one of the largest Hollywood film collections that we steward together. So Luther Allison, we have, you know, from his uh, archive, his uh, um, shirt that he wore right before he passed, as well as uh, papers, photographs, and then his, one of his guitars. This summer, for those who know Tony Shalhoub, uh, from Monk and the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. 
Tony gave us all of his awards, 55 awards, his Emmys, his Golden Globes. He was born in Green Bay and he wanted to be a part of this new history center. He still has a house in Door County too. Uh, so he's an avid uh, uh, person who loves history and we're very happy to steward his collection for him forward. Gives you an idea of the Golden, oh, these are the Emmys. So I mentioned our partnership with Wisconsin Film and Theater Research Center. So we actually have the Mary Tyler Moore collection as well, and not just the show, but her entire production archive. So from Hill Street Blues, and also uh, we have director scripts that go back to Orson Welles' director's copy of Citizen Kane. All that uh, will be rotated through the History Center. So we're telling stories. And the exploration and inspiration hasn't stopped. So many of you have heard about this probably in June of 2021. One of our archaeologists, underwater archaeologists, uh, Tamara Thompson, uh, wrote on this note, I think I'll read it to you, dugout canoe, exclamation point, with a little bit of a, um, a question mark next to it. This is the day she found it. And so this is in the, the waters of um, Mendota in early June when she found it. And the interesting thing about it, if you don't know this, she actually found artifacts too. So these artifacts, there, there are uh, carved stones, they're fishing net weights. So um, they would have uh, held the boat, the net, net to the bottom and gourds would have floated on top. So it, when they found this, this was thought to be like maybe a hundred years old. Maybe it was Frederick Jackson Turner, one of his students, you know, canoes that they uh, were making back then, or maybe it was a 1950s um, Boy Scout project. They just didn't think it was that old. So we carbon tested it to make sure. And you may have heard it goes back to 800 AD. So astounding. Uh, and that, of course, is when the mound builders uh, were living here. So really marks the ancestors, the Ho-Chunk, the Kickapoo, and many who have lived here. And it did a, a piece of material culture. So we brought that up. So bringing it out of the lake and with the Ho-Chunk, by the way, to take care of it and steward it. And where are we stewarding it? And you can see it coming up here. This is just pulling, being pulled out. Like it's about 16 feet long, uh, made out of white oak. Wow. And it's in the State Archive Preservation Facility. So where we have uh, the books, the films, the artwork, everything else. And this is actually in a tank in our large conservation area. A tank of water will be there for three years, and we're rotating um, polyethyl glycol through there. So this object will be in the History Center. And we're doing it with the Ho-Chunk. We also are partnering with the University of Wisconsin-Madison to actually uh, explore some of the canoe. This actually renderings were done by the School of Engineering when they scanned it. So give you a further context, the little star is where uh, Tammy found the canoe. And these areas where there are little houses, that's where um, there used to be villages. And of course the squiggly lines and some of these over here are reminiscent of mounds today. So Tammy went back with a uh, some students to dive to see, you know, a diving school, teach them how to dive and what is underwater archaeology. And yeah, she found it again. So this one she found this summer. Uh, she found another canoe. And she actually uh, wrote to Jim Skibo, our state archaeologist, who was at Ascalon at the time doing work, you know, just texted him instead of finding another canoe. And Tammy is a great person, lighthearted. And so he thought she was kidding. And she wrote back, no, 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 drive back now. <laughs> so... Uh, and so this summer uh, they dated it and it was dated to um, you know, 1121 BC. Wow. So this is floating the canoe, bringing it back. And we did this in September. And again, working with the Ho-Chunk, right? We have not stopped working with the Ho-Chunk. So we called the Ho-Chunk immediately when we found this and uh, Bill Quackenbush, who's their tribal uh, historic preservation officer uh, contacted um, Marlon Wet Eagle, the president of the Ho-Chunk. And then we all got together and we decided that uh, with other nations too, that we should bring it back out and study it. Because otherwise it would go away. It was just gonna be lost to the elements. So here is uh, our Ho-Chunk uh, colleagues. This is President White Eagle, uh, Bill Quackenbush. And this is Larry, Larry uh, Kowalski from uh, Bad River too. 
oh. they participate as well. So this is Larry and Tamara, the one who found the canoe. Um, and so this has truly been a great collaboration. This is a shared curatorial and shared story piece. This is not the Wisconsin Historical Society going by themselves and saying, what do you think, you know, we'll do this and, you know, we can let you in on this. No, this has all been done working together with the nation. So we're very happy about that. And so are the nations too. So this, these objects are, we're looking at the shared curatorial, shared stewardship with the nations. Right now, uh, we're bringing together our expertise of their knowledge of the past with their oral histories and, and also um, using ground proof radar to look on the lake this winter time to see if there's more that's down there too. And that's a system that they know how to run better than us. So it really is shared expertise. This is Bill Quackenbush and his son, Lucas. They're actually uh, spraying a little bit of water and Lucas has a, a brush, if you can see that, he's actually wiping out the sand. So preparing it to be immersed in the tank. So great stories, both on process, but also objects to tell the story of humanity that have lived in the Isthmus region for many, many years. So where are we gonna tell these stories? We currently have this museum building on Capitol Square. And if you look to our neighbors, and this building, by the way, uh, over here, this is actually uh, the old Wolf Kubli Hersey hardware store building. We moved in there in 1984. And before that, the museum was actually in the basement of headquarters. And uh, people went downstairs. We still have an exhibit, the Hamilton archaeological tools that are uh, there a little bit over from that era. And before that, um, it was up on the fourth floor. So wouldn't it be nice to build something like the Minnesota History Center was built almost 25 years ago, a little bit more than that now in St. Paul or the Indiana State Museum or the North Dakota Heritage Center, which just recently opened. We think we deserve a new history center and I hope you think as well. So what did we do? Um, we started our journey. Uh, we hired an architecture firm to actually Continuum Architects, their Wisconsin-based firm. Uh, they built the Chazen Edition, as well as Smith Group, which is a national firm. Um, and they're known for the museums that they built, such as the National Museum of African American History and Culture for the Smithsonian and the American Indian Museum. They have also done many state museums. It's just core to one of their uh, projects that they continually do are just museum and cultural centers. So we decided to start with this, the vision a center of inspiration and exploration where people and communities connect to one another across time throughout our shared, again, American experiences. We started to go out um, in through the kind of countryside of Wisconsin, if you will, visited, visited 55 cities in all the nations and towns, I would say, and 55 cities, towns, and nations, because it's not 55 cities. But uh, we went to Superior, where this shot is, and actually talking with people about what are the stories they want to have told, and doing oral histories as well, too. And we're continuing to do that today. Uh, here's a shot of um, right before the pandemic, when we were doing uh, one of these listening sessions here at the Historical Society. And that's Fanny Hicklin, um, who used to be our president for the BOC. We've been in Milwaukee. Some people don't agree with what, maybe some things, the stories, or they're challenging us. So we've had really good, <laughs> robust conversation. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm making a little bit of light of that. But this was really a, a powerful moment for people to say, we really want our stories told here, and we're going to hold you accountable. And so that's actually fantastic because what we're doing is we're building the People's Museum designed for the people with the people. And so we settled on after those initial conversations that it should be uh, three pillars to have the program and guest experience built on. The first being, of course, the Center for American History and a place where we can have exhibitions about our shared American history, a place where actually people can come to Wisconsin uh, and not necessarily have to go to um, into the Smithsonian for an American history story, go a little bit of a National Museum of the Midwest, if you will, a flagship venue for the society. This is why we're calling it a history center too, rather than just a museum, it's more than. We want it to be a place where we can actually do some of the things from historic preservation, to actually um, launching book publications, 
having educational conferences, as well as having uh, dialogue and debate using history as a foundational tool to talk about what are the speed of culture moments in our time. We believe that history is about transformational moments and, and how those moments happen. Our job is to bring those moments and connect them to the present so people can be inspired by that. And of course, then a center for community engagement. Where can people tell their stories? So having a local history gallery or a gallery that we can do um, quicker changeovers for the different communities too. All built in the history center. I love this photograph for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the architect really got it at first in terms of um, they when they were listening to us about we want this to be a hub that connected you know our sites but also local cultural history sites across the state because we want this to serve all 72 counties the only thing they got wrong is madison is not where wasa is as you can see that <laughs> uh and circus world is not necessarily you know on the mississippi river it's so he's from washington dc so we'll give him a <laughs> But I love this because it really does show, you know, where we are um, in terms of like, can we connect to Madeline Island? Can we connect to all the various affiliates that we have conceptually? And yes, we can. So we have 428 uh, historical organizations that are affiliated with us currently. And thinking about all 72 counties and those school districts in there, how we can serve them as well too. So this is where we are today, right? Uh, here's State Street right down here. This is the current museum. These are some buildings next to us that we just bought last year to do it. And what we're going to do then is this block, if you're looking at it, and again, State Street's down here. Uh, Carol, Fairchild, Mifflin, through here. We're going to tear down these three structures. We're going to do it at the end of 23, um, or perhaps the beginning of 24. We're currently moving out of our building. Uh, the third and fourth floors are being emptied, and all the artifacts will be out of there by uh, the end of this month, it looks like, or mid-December. And then we're starting to work on the second floor. Uh, we hope to be out of the th second, third, and fourth floors altogether in February. The first floor will remain open with the store in there and some limited program. And then we're actually looking for a space around the square where we can move temporarily while the museums or the history center is being built and it's scheduled to open up in 2026. Yeah. So it'll have exhibitions, special events. Uh, we wanna have a wonderful atrium for um, people to see the Capitol. it will be a great view. Classrooms, uh, merchandise, collections, place to where we can stage exhibits and food right now. You can't really get anything to eat inside the museum. This gives you an idea of architectural massing. Um, so you're showing, I'm showing you things right now that are just like in the past couple of weeks we accomplished. So where we are right now with the design is that it's going to be um, probably five floors that are 25 to 29 feet apiece. And there'll be a terrace up on top um, that will overlook the Capitol and overlook State Street and then also have uh, an indoor part of that. This is not an architectural rendering for style. It's not gonna be a minimalist building or a film class <laughs> building or anything like that. We're not showing that, but I'll tell you what, what was built in the RFP is that it needs to be a connection. The materials and the structure need to be a, a connection to Wisconsin. It needs to feel like the People's Museum. It needs to be a community building. It needs to feel like everybody is welcome there. And we want it to be an architectural statement that will be a national historic landmark in 50 years that the people will gladly accept and say, we want to preserve this. So this is for the long haul, folks. This is not a, a 30 year fix. This is a, for 100 to 200 years. So we hired an exhibition firm, Ralph Applebaum and Associates, and they just so happened to actually work with the Smith Group when they built uh, and designed the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. So they're a great group. Um, Ralph Applebaum, they've done things across the world, lots of state museums. Um, they've just opened up the first Americans Museum in Oklahoma, mm. in Oklahoma City. They did the US Capitol Center. So that's another connection for us. They know how to do that. And they know how to tell stories and narratives really well um, that are challenging. And, you know, we have 
uh, an obligation to tell the truth in history and bring up some stories of the past that perhaps people are uncomfortable with. But how do you do that effectively? So this is a shot from the Holocaust Museum and Memorial. And these are actually uh, shoes of people that didn't survive um, the ghettos or uh, Auschwitz. So for us, when we look at kind of the four floors of content, uh, we're looking at American experiences up on top. And we're looking at the innovation hub on the second one. So you can imagine that that would be where uh, people could see things like um, the Epic computer or the uh, ultralight wing, the human landscape. That's where our great agricultural collection will be uh, focused too. Nanny's kitchen is actually going to be an operating kitchen where people can be, uh, chefs can actually demonstrate uh, food ways and it'll have a kitchen uh, where recipes can be made and it'll be a very interactive experience. So this is a place where we'll actually we'll talk about um, timbering, natural resources as well too. And then of course, pop history and theater. So that's where the film and entertainment stuff will be. So you think about American experiences and you think about an innovation hub, human landscape, and pop history. That's where the themes of Wisconsin, the history of Wisconsin, will all go through there too, of course. And this is also going to be built on the, on the third edition of our Wisconsin textbook that we publish for the third and fourth grade students. Right now, 72% of our students and teachers use that textbook. Wow. And so we're working on the third version, which will be a dynamic digital version too, but teachers will be able to uh, come inside the museum and teach using that textbook. Wow, awesome. And then the changing gallery is gonna be about 10,000 square feet. It can be broken up into about three, uh, three different galleries if we want to, to separate them. The first exhibit is gonna be about the American 250th uh, commemoration. So, the new history center, it will be a center of American history. It'll be a flagship venue for the society. It'll be a place where community uh, are engaged and community engagement is uh, uh, on top of everything uh, where people can have robust conversations and dialogue, but also a place of learning. You know, I really believe that our organization is not an educational organization only, but it's a learning organization. So the process of learning we work into as well. And then the connector for all 72 counties, tribal nations, and our affiliates. So right now, we're working in communities again. We're taking some of these design ideas that I'm showing you uh, and then actually bringing them out into the public again. So we stopped during the pa pandemic, but we're back out. We're actually going to be um, energizing next year of the kind of museum without walls idea all throughout all 72 counties. We're actually going to be bringing our collections out to our affiliates when we're shut down and doing programs throughout the state of Wisconsin. So we're going to be warming up our new audiences and our existing audiences to the History Center that's about to open in 2026. So with that, I'm glad to take questions. and Thank you for your time for listening to me talk about this. As you can tell, it's a very exciting moment for the Wisconsin Historical Society. And we're very happy to entertain questions and comments. I love since you're thank, such a wonderful you, job. I love your feedback. Thank you, Christian. It's wonderful. And I'll be looking, monitoring the chat. So you can too, if you want to. Uh, let me ask some questions as we start. How's the fundraising going for this? Great question. Let's see. I'm going to try and stop sharing this. Let's see. I can come back online here. There we go. Yeah. Uh, great question. So where we are right now is we've raised 70 million from the state you know, for um, their enumeration for the actual building. We've raised private funds, uh, 41 million now, you know, that we've raised. Uh, and of course we're dealing with inflation. So the project was spec to be a $120 million project. And so we're looking at raising more money. We're over fundraising because of the uh, construction costs. Perhaps we don't know really right now what's going on. Um, it'll, when we build in 2024, but we're getting ready to just raise a little bit more money. The other thing we're doing too is we're raising money for um, the transitional costs. That's expected, and that amount of money uh, we're continuing to raise throughout this year. And uh, we're raising a $15 million endowment. 
So rather than build it and they will come and working on some operating model that, you know, we're just going to have earned revenue, we need to have a, a really good portfolio of revenue, earned income. So we'll have uh, catered events, admission, as well as retail, but also we'll have an endowment to sustain the operations and grow the operations. Now, I know haven't some of the, you know, the, the, the satellite ones like Villa Louie and Old World, those are all yours, correct? Yep. And they've been they've been sort of struggling for money. Is, is this is this going to take away from efforts to continue to help those all those other ones we have? No, actually. Um, so we have our own foundation, right? And so we actually have annual fund appeals that are going on at the same time. So our money has actually um, people been giving more, and our membership has been giving more too. So we're actually diversifying our portfolio for the entire organization as well. Uh, we're starting a sponsorship program uh, where people, uh, where people or corporations can actually become partners with ours and do some statewide sponsorship, especially for the pop-up exhibit piece because we're going to be going around the state. So that money is going to help out not just the history center, but it's also helping out our other state entities too. Um, and just to give you an example of what's going on, because I call this the era of simultaneity at the Wisconsin Historical Society. Uh, we're at Old World Wisconsin. We have a $16 million project that's going to be closed out in the next couple of years. Uh, and that's the arrivals project. We just received, um, let's see, $2.8 million from the U.S. Department of Congress, co Commerce from the Economic Development Administration. And um, We've raised about six million, eight and a half million towards that now, and the state's kicking in money too. Uh, we're also been successful in two half million dollars Save America Treasures grants for Circus World Museum mm -hmm. and for the old Ringlingville uh, National Historic Landmark buildings. Uh, Pendarvis, you know, which is on Mineral Point, uh, we had the Jeffress Foundation fund the entire historic structures report and the plan for the restoration of that, and that's coming up in the next campaign. Um, Villa Louis, uh, you mentioned that we just replaced the sidewalk around it and we uh, just invested more operational money in there too. So for, for us, uh, you know, this is going quite well, but to my point about diversifying our revenue portfolio, we wanted to, you know, even out some of the state sponsorship, endowment, annual giving, capital giving, so we can earn revenue. So we actually have can ride the waves of the economy going up and down and not be this or that. Well, there are two questions in the chat. One is, and, I, and this is one of the reasons I wanted you to talk to this group because they're both about donating. <laughs> how can we donate? And the other one is, how are all these fundraising efforts going? How are they being publicized? I've not heard any of this. Right, so great question. First of all, we're on the quiet side of the campaign for the History Center. It's kind of weird to be in a quiet side campaign and being a public entity, <laughs> you know, a state, an independent state agency. But that that's how it's going. And we haven't really announced the entire campaign yet publicly to go large on it. Uh, that's going to come with the, the next version of the statewide pop-up piece. So that allows us to be across the state and then talk about actually what we're doing. Uh, so that's scheduled to come out next year. As far as giving, uh, we actually have, uh, you can go right on our site. If you go to uh, look underneath, I think it would be under browse and look at a, um, uh, about, you'll find the Wisconsin Historical Foundation and you can find out how to give there too. On the very bottom of the webpage too uh, is the History Center. You can click on there and scroll through some of the things I talked about and you can find the foundation there as well. So uh, very happy to accept donations. And uh, for those who are really interested in the feedback that we've got, if you go into the new History Center webpage too and scroll down to the Share Your Voice sessions, um, you can actually pop up what was said in Superior, uh, La Crosse, and other places too before the pandemic. And we'll be adding new content in this next round too. So it's kind of fun. People's voices are being shared and they're being heard. I love the fact that you did such a survey of people everywhere. I think that's really, that's just so impressive to get that, to get that out. Uh, the question here is, uh, is the State Vet Museum not included? And if not, why? Right. The State uh, Veterans Museum is not included. There have been iterations, you know, over the 20 years um, that we've seen them being part of us and not. 
Uh, to be honest with you, what had happened was is that uh, when we got enumerated for 70 million, uh, Governor Evers and uh, uh, Secretary Joel Brennan of the DOA at that point in time asked the vets and us to look at each other, could we do it again? And we looked at a variety of models to figure out, and this was when we were looking at, if those who follow the papers, there was one time when we were um, looking at across the Capitol Square on East Washington, where the Jeff One building is, the Workforce yeah. Development Building, we were looking at, could that be a possible future space for the museum and the Vets Museum too? So we explored that. Uh, the Veterans Museum Board of Foundation wanted to fundraise by themselves and they wanted it to be a distinct museum. We were trying to build a little campus before, but um, they wanted to be a distinct museum by themselves and that was their decision. So we went back to the governor and the Department of um, uh, Administration Secretary, Secretary Joel Brennan and uh, Mary Kohler, who's the Secretary of the Vets and I discussed what we found and, um, and they said, that's fine. So the Vets Museum is on a different track. Uh, we hear, we're very friendly with them. We actually share uh, space inside the state historic uh, or the state archive preservation facility that I showed you. They actually have um, share, we share some of the conservation labs with them as well as they have their collection there too. Oh, wow. But right now we're building two distinctly separate buildings. Yeah, and that and actually I lost track of this. I thought you were going over to Jeff one. Because I know as we, you know, people work from home and everything changes, um, but but you ended up being where you're going to be. Right. We actually bought um, Fred Moses buildings, yeah. the two buildings, his law offices and next to us. And so um, that's, we figured out we could build a hundred, um, 10,000 square foot building right there, right across from the Capitol. And, and so we we figured out we didn't have to wait for an, another state building being demoed. We could just do that and start the process and start mm -hmm. the project and make our 2026 date. That was important for us, important for our donors too, that, you know, seeing this actually come through. So it's been greenlit, you know, it went to the state building commission this spring um, and they gave us the, the green light to go through architectural drawings. We're going through 35%. We come back to them just like any other state building. And then uh, we get approved for the rest of the build out. Wow, amazing. Um, so are you dealing with a particular board um, for this whole project or the foundation doing it or how's that work? So the Wisconsin Historical <clears throat> Society is an independent agency and it has right. something called the Board of Curators which um, the majority of the Board of Curators is elected, not appointed. But we do have appointments from the governor and the legislature and a couple of emeritus. And like UW Systems President, Jay Rothman has a seat on there. Uh, and so we have those, but it's a self-fulfilling uh, uh, elected board as well as appointed. Our foundation has a board too. We've actually combined something called the Joint Museum Oversight Committee, which has the executives from both uh, boards on that, and they review kind of the larger um, uh, expenditures, if you will, like, you know, like architecture firms, you know, it's a lot of money to start, you know, architecture and engineering. So we walk through that and the board uh, looks at that to make sure that we're, uh, they're involved in, in a, and they're approving our expenditures. Ed, you mentioned uh, before that you're committed, uh, and rightfully so, to telling um, the facts, uh, telling the story the way it uh, ought to be told and, and the way it occurred. Uh, a concern today, unfortunately, is pressure uh, on enterprises like yours to not tell the story uh, if it is uncomfortable. Um, are you, uh, is your past experience uh, prepared you for those kinds of pressures? Are you anticipating anything like that? So, I, first of all, we don't politicize history as a state agency. You know, I mentioned, you know, people asking me this question, they say like, well, how do you do that, you know, in a political environment? And I say, we're, we're the aisle. You know, we're not one side or the other, we're the aisle. We're, we look at the whole story. So when I think the case point that happened with um, Act 10 in mm -hmm. Wisconsin, a big story, right? It was a national story. People were hearing that around, our curators and archivists went out and collected the stories from both sides. So we walked through that way too um, during that time about whose story you're gonna tell. And we said, we're telling the entire story. 
So, you know, from both points of view, we've collected that story. Just like, you know, when we talk about um, the colonies, you know, starting in the United States, it, there's a ways to tell these stories today. <clears throat> Is it about freedom of speech? Is it about religious freedom? Sure, you can weave those in, but it's also really uh, woven in in terms of like the 13 colonies or, or the colonies established by um, uh, Britain and the king. They were businesses. They were business ventures. And and starting off in that way, and then how did people populate those areas? What did they bring with them, the diverse cultures? Uh, you know, we've just had some really great work that's been done the past uh, five years about the French commingling and living with uh, the nations in Wisconsin and Canada and Michigan. And so before politics pull people apart. And so there's ways to actually bring people together. I think the Ho-Chunk's canoes and their ancestors of canoes are one of those ways too. You know, that it's just, it's it, Ho-Chunk and we're right. And so we're the Kickapoo. They've lived here, you know, for thousands of years. I'm sure we're going to find more. I'm sure we're going to go back, you know, further than that. But having those kind of dialogues about how to tell those stories and the land that people lived in are important. Dealing with some tough subjects like the Civil War and what happened after the Civil War and Amer um, uh, American civil rights, we have a responsibility to tell that story correctly. And, you know, since we actually um, have a number of bu uh, books published on our collection already, we can reference that as well, too. So I think to be fair to people, we're telling everybody's story. Uh, we're finding ways and creative ways how to do that with technology. Uh, oral histories as well, too. And we're not omitting people's stories. That's the other thing. It's not like we're going one way and not the other. We're actually telling everybody's story in the 72 counties and how to do that um, effectively. So we follow up on that question. Uh, uh, I assume that means you would have collected the protest signs and support signs yep. at the big rallies. You have, you have both sides, the protest signs and those somewhere in your archive. Yeah. At the State Archive Preservation Facility. You had someone out there collecting, take, I want your sign, I want your sign. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys are sometimes involved right in the middle of things when it happens? You send people Yes. Out? So um, actually, we've got, as part of the DNA of the Wisconsin Historical Society, Lyman Draper, um, our first director during the American Civil War, when soldier must, soldiers are being mustered out of Camp Randall, he actually was sending out diaries with pencils and saying, you know, and he stamped them in the back, you know, Wisconsin historical site, please return to. We have over 700 of those diaries today that came back from Gettysburg, you know, Tietum, you know, all over the place. And, and he, and other, and some soldiers took diaries to give to other people. They just, and said, Hey, you want to fill this out and send it back. So we have more than Wisconsin, you know, uh, soldiers reminiscences about that. So that's a first foray into that. When the, so we did that with also um, the Peace Corps. The, when John F. Kennedy announced the Peace Corps, we sent out journals for the first two to three years of Peace Corps um, um, workers. We also did that uh, for five years in the 60s with archivists, sending our archivists and graduate students from UW-Wisconsin into the South, along with the Freedom Riders, collecting things. That's how we got the Little Rock Nine papers from Daisy Bates. We have the Highlander Folk School papers, and that's where um, labor leaders were trained, um, as well as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. So we have all that. We have Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on audio tape going through practicing, you know, you know, the kind of the civil disobedience passively, you know, and peacefully. So all of that's here. And it was actively collected during its time. COVID journaling, we did our own journal project. We have over 2,900 people signed up in Wisconsin. We've seen 300 so far of journals being writ written during the COVID journaling project. During the um, Black Lives Matter movement, we collected, again, stuff from people protesting. You know, uh, We collected a memorial, too. Some of the um, plywood that was on the uh, State Street oh, State is now Street. in our collection. Really, the actual plywood, not just photos. No, the actual plywood. You know, for, for us, it's about documenting the material culture. 
So photos are one thing, and we did that. Um, and we worked in partnership with the University of Wisconsin or PBS Wisconsin uh, on it too. They just fear on camera, they went up and down that, but we actually collected the uh, real objects. We have a memorial that was in front of the Capitol that uh, was about 15 feet wide with people's photographs and it was built there. And, you know, when the state said they had to move it, we said we wanted it. Wow. Well, Isn't, I mean, the building that you described, the, the project, is absolutely fantastic, but isn't it too small? <laughs> oh, sure. So I described, you know, the Ford Museum is four and uh, five thousand square feet of exhibition space. So that's about eight acres, right? That's massive. Or well, think about the Field Museum; it's about the same, or the Museum of Science and Industry. But the idea is, is that with that ten thousand square foot exhibition space that's rotating, we can actually change things in and out and tell thematic stories too. So. You know, we're looking at three turns a year, and then maybe there's two, you know, making a couple smaller ones going on at the same time. So we have multiple shows. So it's a very different operating model and learning model than we have today at the, at the Wisconsin Historical Museum. So let's go. I'm going to go back to Dennis's question from a different angle uh, on uncomfortable things and what do you do with it? Are you guys in charge of all the roadside plaques, historical roadside plaques? The markers? Plaques? Yeah. Yes. So I look. I think particularly of uh, how was the Black Hawk Wars described? How were the Native nations described in those that were written probably in the fifties and sixties? Yep. Are they going to be changed and updated? I've read some that seem to me to be a bit. Uh, I won't say offensive, but at least not not sympathetic to what was happening at the time. Where do those kind of things stand in in terms of what you do? That's a great question. Thank you, um, Terry. And thank you for Dennis for prompting that for Terry, to, your question to him to ask his. <laughs> but the the it's a big deal for us, right? Public history that's out there in that way. We've done the assessment. We know where those signs are. We've actually written a grant. We got funded from the Pomeroy Foundation and they're a foundation out of Syracuse, New York that loves uh, marker programs and to change them. So we just get our first grant was 35 to redo 35. And, and an additional five new ones. So that's ongoing. We just did a, um, the State Fair mound marker uh, that has uh, actually talking about where a mound is, uh, an Indian uh, mound that uh, so that it doesn't get damaged anymore. Um, the Ivanhoe Resort marker yeah. finally went up as far as one of the new ones that just came out. That's great. Uh, and then we were slowly going through these. We have about 65 that are pretty bad. Really? We have about, you know, maybe, so there's 600 markers out there right now, right? We have probably have 120 more that, you know, could do a little bit better job than that. And just kind of like, you know, it's not exactly the way we understand it today. And, and one of the reasons why this happens is the former marker program, and still exists that way today, is that it's a way for the public to interact and create their own stories locally. We facilitate that. And so they raise their own money. Uh, for their own sign. We actually edit the sign. So we take responsibility of what's been edited in the past during the 50s. Um, some stuff that's up there uh, right after World War II, um, you know, referring to different countries during World War II with some bad phrasing, uh, the people of those countries. So yeah, we're going through that and we know where they are. So it's a great question. It's going to take us a number of years to do, but it's not going to take us a decade. Yeah, it'll be more than five years when we can get through this. I remember being at Little Bighorn before things changed out there and going back recently to see how that was reinterpreted or re-explained to a different thing. Uh, there's a question here. Trump politicized federal government records. Are there any state examples comparable to you that you guys have run into? Oh, can you state that again? Trump, uh, it says Trump politicized federal government records. Are there any state exam comparable examples that you've run into here? Where someone politicized our records? Yeah, that Trump, yeah, that, that Trump, I, I think the idea is that record keeping was not exactly done the way we've done a lot of things under the oh. Trump administration. Uh, have there been any glitches here in terms of you guys getting records, emails, et cetera? No, uh, I, I understand the question. No, thank you for clarifying that. So there's a state archives um, retention board that uh, we have a state archivist that's on that board and we support that board, but there's private citizens on that board too. 
as well as librarian archivists um, that are appointed from different parts of the state. So that's the, that's the retention scheduling board of where things come into and how they get to us. And they go first to a, uh, another preservation facility. And then if they're deemed historical, then they come to us as well. So there's a whole process that goes through. And actually we do that with every county as well, with the exception of Milwaukee. And so we have archivists that work with county records as well as the state records too. We have a collecting schedule you know, for like the governor's office and a collecting plan. Wherever the governor is, you know, they know that this is eventually going to come to society. Um, and then uh, we go in there right before they leave too. And, you know, we've had conversations beforehand too about uh, what to keep and tell the story. And lieutenant governors as well, um, speakers as well. Um, so all of that is in the retention schedule. And to my knowledge, that's not been politicized where people have said, I'm not going to give anything or anything like that. Or take it home to somebody's home. <laughs> no, but some sometimes, you know what, in our business, sometimes that happens uh -huh. where people, you know, people will say, you know, I found this and it, and it probably may have not been part of any retention schedule, but it has historical value. It happens with people's clothing, um, other material objects for people, um, you know, things that, you know, people like a pen from something, you know, people say, I think my father was this and, you know, they send these things. Um, but, you know, we get things uh, on an ongoing regular schedule. I know someone who has a spittoon from her da dad's days in the legislature. Should that have been turned in? <laughs> no. You don't want that. Okay. <laughs> well, should it have been turned in? I, it wasn't have been on a retention schedule. Do people want to talk to us about that? Sure. We, you know, we, so, we, we're interested in those conversations. How much do you reject? I mean, what do people, I mean, like, there's been people with all their button collections. Uh, yeah. There's something going on at UW right now. Does somebody have all 112 homecoming reunion buttons? Yeah. Uh, how do you turn, how do you say, no, what do you say no to? So we have a collection committee. And we have, first of all, we have a collection policy that defines the categories thematically, you know, that we're collecting. And that collection, that's approved by the board. And so that's a guiding post that if we look at every five years, let's say, or so to change, you know, depending on the times we're living in. The collection committee is about 20 people uh, from curators, archaeologists, archivists, and librarians. They meet every two weeks. It's a robust discussion because going into the state collection is forever, right? We don't sell stuff off. We're not in that world. You know, if you get into the Wisconsin State Historical Society collection, there's permanency with that. And so we're very careful about what comes in, but also we're very eager to have things in. You know, with the State Archive Preservation Facility, some of our colleagues on the East Coast are not really collecting as robust as we are because we have the room. Now, it'll fill up at some point, but it's designed to actually add on to. But that's not, that's decades away, right? But the point is, is that every two weeks between 50 and 500 objects or holdings are approved to come in. With that, um, there's things that we turn down, like maybe it's a postcard collection that we already have, or maybe it's something that's totally out of scope, like a, a medical thing that maybe the UW um, library would you know, like to have that. So we try to defer things, especially if they're in Wisconsin and we don't want them, to go to local county historical societies. That's mm -hmm. part of our affiliate you know, group to help build their collections too. Wow. But we get a lot of wedding dresses offered to us. <laughs> we have to let you go in two minutes. Uh, I have one last question is, you must have had to do a lot of catch up to know Wisconsin, a steep learning curve. I mean, you're coming from Michigan, been there 26 years. Uh, is this a pretty good place? I mean, how did you pick up all the stuff you know already about Wisconsin? I grew up in Minneapolis and Western Wisconsin. So um, I often talk about the St. Croix River you know, Valley as Alsace-Lorraine you know, for the Minnesota and Wisconsin um, groups. You know, for me, you know, I went to Hayward every year in you know, the summer vacation with my cousins. I went to the Dells for 14 years and Circus World Museum for 14 years because my mother's sister lived in Chicago. And so we did the, the shared experiences going back and forth. My father had his camping at Bayfield, you know, or actually Madeline Island at the state park up there uh, for many years. And, okay. and so you know, Wisconsin's just been part of my life. Okay. And then when the Elroy Sparta bike trails came through, 
you know, when I was in high school, you know, I was a big biker back then. And so, you know, biking through Wisconsin through the train tunnels, you know, mm. when, we, when they came out was just wonderful. Awesome. And I actually uh, uh, raced at the Schwamigan Fat Tire Festival, uh, which is a mountain mm. bike race. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not, I don't have that build anymore. Uh, <laughs> but my first ski race was also one uh, at Telmark and Cable as well. So the, a lot of it is just in my blood and, you know, from relatives living here. And, you know, before we started, people, uh, someone was asking me about my name, uh, Overland, Erveland in Norway. But my uh, grandfather's family bought a farm in Trumplow County. And that's where they first settled before they moved to Duluth. And then he became a boilermaker. He moved off the farm and worked with the Duluth Masabi Railroad. So I got a few genes in here. I think so. I think so. I want to say thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Dennis to give you the official thanks. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, it may or may not be official, but certainly is uh, heartfelt. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's been very interesting, uh, very informative. And uh, best of uh, luck to all of us for this project to really be successful and robust. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you. And for people, continue to follow us and look at our webpage. If you're interested in, in you know, um, connecting with us there, that's a way to do it. And with the foundation as well. Thank you all. And thank you for your interest in the future of history for Wisconsin. Thanks, Christian. Good. Thank you. Bye -bye. Dennis, I'll turn it over to you. Um, well, uh, um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, a reminder, uh, next week at this time, we're all going to be voting or we're going to be working on the polls. So we will not be meeting. Uh, so we'll get together again uh, two weeks from uh, uh, from now and uh, sort through what happened a week from now. So happy voting. Vote as often as you can. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Cheers. Bye, Bye now.